really exciting to be here, and I'm grateful for the invitation and a chance to talk about my research. Um, so just a little disclaimer, um, I, my research is very basic research, so I'm interested in all these theoretical questions to really get into the mind of somebody with autism. And so as you're listening, you might think, well, how is this useful, or what's the point of this research? And I think, like all basic research, learning more about how something works in autism or anything will eventually, down the road, lead to a better understanding how, of how the autism mind works and, um, and help to lead towards better treatments for autism. So, and so, we've already had this conversation, so a little disclosure, I do research on autism. I also have a son with autism, he's 26, so I'll be mentioning a few little anecdotes about him. Um, all right. So basically what I'm going to be talking about today is you know, some general characteristics of language in autism, um, and then figurative language. I'll talk about what that is and how it relates to autism. Um, and then talking a little bit about lateralization and the left versus right hemisphere dichotomy and those kinds of issues in autism. Um, and then linking that to a theory called weak central coherence, which is a cognitive theory about how uh, people with autism kind of organize their reality in their world, and then I'll kind of pull it all together with, you know, what, what can we learn from all this about, about autism and how the autistic mind works. So I want to say, please feel free at any time to ask questions. So if I'm, like, rambling on about some study and you don't get what I'm saying, please feel to raise your hand and ask a question. Or if you have a comment or whatever, let's just keep this casual. Um, and I also want to mention that I'm probably going to say autism and autism spectrum disorders. Um, I'll use those terms interchangeably. I'm not being super pre precise in how I'm defining this. And it definitely includes Asperger syndrome or Asperger syndrome. So, All right. So probably with this audience, I don't need to spend a lot of time defining what autism is. But we know that it's a highly heritable disorder. Um, and it's no specific etiology that we know of. But it's defined by three main criteria. At least it was until the new DSM came out. Um, difficulties with communication, social interactions, and repetitive and restrictive behaviors. Um, language in autism is characterized by poor uh, language difficulties. So there's the whole spectrum from kids who are completely nonverbal um, up to kids with autism who seem to have really relatively small uh, problems with language. But the core language difficulties include things like phonological problems, lexical problems. Um, semantic and syntactic problems. Um, some common, and I'm sure you probably all know this, some common characteristics that you'll see in kids with autism are things like pronoun reversal, referring to themselves with the wrong pronoun or you with the wrong pronoun, echolalia, um, they'll make up their own words and so on. The interesting thing is that particularly on the high end of the spectrum, um, we have kids that don't have any of these traditional characteristics of language, and yet they still have problems with higher level aspects of language functioning. Uh, so for example, they could have atypical prosody. So you might hear kids, you know, not use the right intonation patterns when they're communicating, you know, like maybe using a sing-song voice or whatever. Um, uh, and then more germane to what I'm going to be talking about, they have pragmatic deficits. So they, they might do really great on some language battery um, and test normal, but when it comes to actually using language, they have more of a problem, so the social use of language. And finally, uh, it seems that there are lots of issues with kids with autism understanding figurative language. Um, and it seems that you could say that there's this literal bias in autism, all right? So if you say, I love long baths, you don't mean this kind of a long <laughs> bath. <laughs> um, and a person with, on the autism spectrum might get a little confused about that. Um, Uta Frith is a researcher who's done a lot of work on autism. And back in 1989, she made this claim, what a literal bias in autism it means and why it occurs are keys to the understanding of autism. Now that is probably a little overstated, but I have to justify my work somehow. So. <laughs> um, I think uh, it's very interesting to think about 
what cognitive processes happen for kids with autism and people, adults with autism, and, and why that might be. So what is figurative language? I've been a little vague so far. Figurative language um, involves any kind of language where the literal meaning of what is spoken doesn't correspond to the actual meaning that, it, that is trying to be conveyed. So that includes things like metaphors, idioms, um, sarcasm, that's a great example, um, and we know that kids with autism often have trouble with sarcasm. Um, inferences, all right? So if I say someone's walking down the street and um, their foot is dragging, um, there's an inference that that person hurt their foot, right? You're not actually saying that. Kids with autism might have trouble with things that aren't explicitly stated. And then, of course, indirect requests. So can you open the door, or can you open the window, or it's hot in here, or it's seen as just factual questions or statements. They, don't, they, they can't mean, oh, it's hot, please open the window. Right? So can you open the door? Yes, I can open the window. <laughs> um, so, and here's one of my favorite metaphors interpreted literally. My heart goes into it. All right. So here are some examples of metaphors. The research that I did um, was, was based on metaphors. Um, that lawyer is a shark. Or what about my job is a jail? My job isn't a jail. I hope your job isn't a jail. And she's an angel. All right, so you've probably all heard these phrases before. And what we find is that uh, if you look at most of the research and work that's been done on metaphor, it's been done on this type of metaphor where there's a, a, a direct um, comparison or overlapping of two uh, domains. All right, so you have this form, X is Y, baby is an angel, job is a jail, and so on. So that, that's kind of what a metaphor is. So we kind of have a picture of what figurative language is. Metaphor is a type of figurative language. This is the form it takes. And, you know, these are the technical terms for, for those parts of the sentence. Um, so the question is, why is it that kids with high-functioning autism who don't have any core language deficits still have trouble with figurative language? So there's still some language difficulties here, and the prosody, actually, which is, yeah, which is there, too. Um, and so I'm going to mention two, several factors. One is has to do with the lateralization of function in the brain. So you might know that language is lateralized to the left hemisphere. So, and really, it's definitely all those core language faculties, um, understanding grammar, meaning, and so on. And then there's all this other stuff that the right hemisphere <laughs> processes. I can tell that you like my technical terms here. Uh, spatial processing, pattern recognition, emotional processing, and so on. Um, and so, you know, that's sort of well known, or not, probably well known in this group at least. Um, but the interesting thing is, you know, even though you say that language is in the left hemisphere, it turns out that there's a lot of, some research and some anecdotes about um, patients that have strokes to their right hemisphere. And if you have a stroke to your right hemisphere, um, you don't get aphasia, typically, but you do tend to have subtle problems with figurative language. So all these things, again, the metaphors, the idioms, direct requests, and it's actually very similar to the profile you see in autism. The sort of tendency to interpret things overly literally. Um, so we could come up with this division of labor between the hemispheres. The left hemisphere has got all this language stuff we already talked about, or is involved in literal language, and figurative language somehow um, is related to right hemisphere functioning. So we have this, this difference. Um, and maybe that's related to a fact about autism that you may not be aware of, and that is that there are lateralization differences in the brains of people with autism, or there's some evidence for that at least. So um, essentially what you find is that there's a reversed 
pattern of asymmetry in the structures of the brains of people with autism. Um, so for example, first of all, in Broca's area, which is the frontal uh, area that's responsible for language, um, we'll find that in control subjects, that the blue NC up there, uh, they actually show um, a larger left Broca's area than right Broca's area. Uh, whereas in the people with autism, they actually show a larger right versus left. It's a little hard to see there. But there's this difference in the brain structures uh, that are lateralized differently. Then in another study, this looked at Wernicke's area, um, the temporal lobe here, and again, what you can see is the black bars are the control subjects. Their left Wernicke's area is larger than their right Wernicke's area, which kind of makes sense that if, if most language is processed in the left hemisphere and Wernicke's area is a language processing area, it's bigger in the left because it's used more. People with autism don't show that. They have the, they have the same size, and you can basically see that their left side is, is smaller. So again, it's a lateralization difference. And then my third example um, was a study that looked at um, a, a large range of cortical areas, all right, so across the whole hemisphere. And again, they found that um, control subjects had this leftward bias to having larger volumes in the cortex on the left, um, and then the autistic indi individuals were larger on the right. Uh, so you can just ignore that little bar there. So, and there, there's more evidence, uh, behavioral evidence as well, to suggest that there's this asymmetry. So we have this asymmetry of language function, um, or a suggestion that there might be uh, this based on stroke patients, left literal, right metaphorical, figurative language. Um, and then we have this idea that maybe there's a, a lateralization difference in the structure or function of the brain. And so maybe there's some relationship. Maybe we can use one to explain the other or connect them. All right, so in order to explore what's going on in the right hemisphere um, in terms of language, we, we probably want to start with typically developing people before we try to figure out what's going on in autism. And so what, what exactly is the role of the right hemisphere in language functioning? Um, and I've explored this using metaphor. So the first study that I'm going to talk to you about is uh, used a technique called the divided visual field method. Um, so what this, this is a picture of kind of how the visual system hooks up with the brain. But basically to shorten it, anything that you see in your right visual field is initially processed in your right hem left hemisphere and, and vice versa. Right hemisphere, uh, sorry, left visual field, right hemisphere, okay? and this. This diagram kind of shows you the pathways of how that works. So because of that, um, obviously information crosses over from one side to the other, but um, it's possible to measure people's reaction times, to stimuli presented on the left versus the right, um, and get see if there are reaction time differences with language. So an experiment looks something like this. Um, you see all these slides in a row. You see the sentence. Um, then you see the last word of the sentence, either left or right, uh, and then you get a question. So this is, this is how it works for a subject. Crosshair, then you read the beginning of the sentence, and then watch really quickly. You see that last word presented very quickly, 200 milliseconds or less, all right? So it gets, if it's presented on the left, it gets into the right hemisphere, um, and, and vice versa, and then we can measure those reaction times. So I did this with a bunch of sentences like this. Um, they were literal or anomalous, meaning they didn't have any meaning, or metaphorical. So the orchestra filled the hall with sunshine. That was our metaphor, all right? And there was the other sentences as well. So we used that paradigm. And what we found is that for the literal sentences, the left visual field, or the right hemisphere, um, was slower at processing those literal sentences than the left hemisphere. Okay, so this is this is not surprising. 
there are many, many studies that get this kind of a result. Because the left hemisphere is the, the language dominant hemisphere. So yeah, it's gonna go fast. Um, and it's gonna be faster at processing language. So that was the literal sentences. Then the metaphorical sentences, okay, not only did they take longer, we showed the opposite pattern of results. So because they were metaphors, the right hemisphere was faster at processing them than the left hemisphere. So this helps to confirm the findings that we have with stroke patients um, using another method and with people that are don't have a stroke. And then the anomalous sentences actually show the same pattern as the literal sentences. And if you want to talk about why that is, we can, we can do that at the end. Okay, so then another study. Um, it turns out that uh, when I looked through the literature on metaphor processing, it seemed that people were throwing all kinds of metaphors at subjects and not really controlling some of the variables very well. And so this is definitely true on any, on, we won't go there. I was gonna say any battery that of metaphor processing that you're doing with metaphor students or kids probably isn't that well controlled for some of these things. So, um, and wh one of the things that they did is they would throw, they would talk about really common metaphors like the ones I've already talked to you about, like that baby is an angel, and then they would throw subjects, throw out subjects, metaphors that were really complicated and hard to understand. And so one of the things I thought is that has got to be a factor that needs to be considered. And so um, I used metaphors like this that were varied in how familiar they would have been to the subjects. So the very high familiarity one would be babies or angels, and the very low familiarity or rain clouds or pregnant ghosts. Okay? Yeah, so I see a few puzzled looks. What does that actually mean? It's very unfamiliar. <laughs> rain clouds are pre uh, pregnant ghosts, so it just means that they're kind of big and they have something that they're going to give birth to soon. <laughs> and they're ghosts because they're kind of white or, you know. Uh, it's an odd, it's an odd, unfamiliar metaphor. You've probably never heard it before, right? Whereas babies or angels, you've probably heard something like that before. All right. So again, these were presented to the subjects in the same way with the divided visual field method. Um, and what we found was nice pattern with very low familiar metaphors where the right hemisphere um, was faster at processing those than the left hemisphere. Whereas the very high familiar metaphors, we saw the opposite pattern. And then kind of the, the medium ones were kind of in between there, kind of following the same pattern. So again, what we can say is, what we can say is that um, it seems that metaphors do recruit the right hemisphere, need the right hemisphere for processing. Um, and, but particularly unfamiliar metaphors. All right, now a third study I wanna tell you about um, was a functional imaging study. So um, you've probably seen lots of these studies in the news with nice brains and blobs on them. They're, they're based on the idea that mental activity um, is related to neural activity and blood flows towards the parts of the brain that are busy or very active. And so then by comparing different conditions we can get a brain scan like this that, sh that shows a comparison of what parts of the brain are busy during different types of tasks. So that's called functional MRI. Um, the, the magnetic technique detects the, the oxygen in the blood that's flowing in different directions. All right, and so for this study, same idea as the previous one I talked about. We looked at literal uh, sentences familiar metaphors and unfamiliar metaphors. Okay, so um, a pond is nature's mirror. I mean, I don't know how familiar that seems to you, but it's more familiar than um, a smile is an ambassador. Okay, so then in this study, what we found are, uh, we're not gonna worry too much about the exact areas, but we definitely found right hemisphere activation. This is not all the findings, but these are the right hemisphere findings. We found right hemisphere activation for figurativeness um, um, or metaphors compared to literal uh, in two right hemisphere regions. 
and then we found um, also for familiarity. So we compared the familiar versus the unfamiliar metaphors, and we had findings in the right hemisphere, and we compared the metaphors versus literal sentences. Okay, so I've just thrown a lot of data at you. Um, let's kind of pull it together. So it does seem that the right hemisphere's role in language comprehension seems to be, um, it seems to be involved in metaphor processing based on the data I've shown so far. Um, and especially metaphors that are difficult or unfamiliar. Um, and basically there's, there are more findings uh, in the literature that have started to support this idea. So, okay, now we're finally getting to it. The implications for autism. Um, and it may be that lateralization abnorm abnormalities could be part of the problem uh, with fact the figurative language in autism, as I've already said. Um, and so you may have heard of the left brain hypothesis or theory of autism. It may be that there's this um, lateralization difference or this leftward processing. So if you're very left in your processing, you're missing out some of that right hemisphere uh, processing in the brain. Um, and so it leads to the question, why would lateralization abnormalities in autism result in figurative language difficulties? So what, why would that be? Um, I mean, other than the very general idea of being a leftward processing style, what's actually going on and so what I'm going to talk to you about now is this connection. So first of all, a little bit more about right hemisphere functioning and language processes explaining a theoretical idea of how does this actually work? Why is the right hemisphere not so great, really good at metaphor or necessary for metaphor processing? And then it, it links to a theory of cognitive processing in autism called weak central coherence. Okay, so in order to look at first those, the theory of right hemisphere language processing, we need to take a look at um, understanding how language is processed in the begin, to begin with. And so one of the things that seems fairly clear from lots of research is that when we access ideas, concepts, words, um, there's this spreading activation network in our brain, right? So if I say the word yellow, um, you're going to activate that word yellow. So there's a linguist here somewhere, right? Or an SLP? Yeah, yeah. So you'll know what I'm talking about for sure. Um, there's a, this activation of that word and then closely related words are gonna also be activated. So that if you're, if you're hearing a sentence, um, you hear the word yellow, you might activate a word like daffodil because that, you can access that word faster and comprehend the sentence faster if you, have easy access to those words. So there's this activation of meanings. Closely related words are activated sooner. Um, you know, basically based on the length of the line, if you would, you know, really categorize somebody's linguistic knowledge. Um, and the strength of that activation weakens as you, as you get further out. Okay, so how might this relate to left and right hemisphere functioning? Well, according to um, uh, a theory of right hemisphere functioning. Um, the left hemisphere, it's from, from Beeman, a guy named Beeman. Um, the left hemisphere has a narrow semantic network, so it doesn't activate very far out. All right, so you have, if, if, if I would flash to your left, left hemisphere the word camel, for example, that might activate a small network of related meanings. Okay, and that's what happens in the, net, in the left hemisphere. The left hemisphere is really efficient at understanding quick sentences, the syntax, the grammar, everything. Um, and it might not activate other words or it may very, very slowly activate words that aren't as related to that word camel. Whereas the right hemisphere, um, according to this theory, which has, has empirical support, in the right hemisphere, the word camel, if you flash it to your right hemisphere, will activate that larger set of related words. Um, and so there's this different characteristic between the left and right hemisphere in terms of meaning activation. Okay, so 
I'm sure you're all puzzled now and saying, so what does that have to do with anything? Well, think about understanding a sentence like, a camel is a desert taxi. All right? In order to understand that, you're, you're going along reading the sentence, um, and first you encounter the word camel, right? And so it means both of your hemispheres are active, and your, your, right, your left hemisphere is going to activate the closely related words, and your left hemisphere will activate then more words. Um, and then next you're going to encounter the word taxi. And again, you're going to then activate closely related words in your left hemisphere and more distantly related words in your right hemisphere, but you still cannot understand this metaphor um, unless you get the shared meaning between those two words, right? So a camel can be a means of transportation, and so can a taxi. So you really need those broad semantic networks in order to really understand the metaphor, because you have to make connections between words that aren't all that closely related in terms of your meaning. So if you don't have good right hemisphere function, you can't understand the metaphor. All right, so that could be what happens with stroke patients and also uh, people on the autism spectrum. All right, so that's one piece of the puzzle. The other piece of the puzzle is this theory called weak central coherence. Um, and I have no idea whether any of you have heard of this before, but um, in the extreme, weak central coherence is not seeing the forest for the trees. All right, and so this is a theory about how people with autism cognitively embrace their world. All right, so if you look at these paintings, for example, um, a person with autism would look at those and just see the vegetables and the fruit and the flowers, all right? They're not gonna see the big picture that those are faces of people, all right? In the extreme, maybe they would see both, but um, that's kind of the idea. And so this leads to a number of characteristics of the cognitive functioning in autism. First of all, and us people who work with people with autism like the idea that autism conveys some advantages. And one of them is advantages in visual processing tasks. So for example, in this embedded figures task, um, you need to find you know, that, that shape in the larger picture, which I can't even do. Maybe it's just a bad copy. Um, and so kids with autism are, are, are better than average at doing this task and finding those embedded pictures. So it has to do with um, seeing the trees and not the forest, or seeing the details rather than the big picture. Um, and you probably all know this better than I do, but kids with autism tend to be good at other visual tasks like block design which you have in intelligence testing, um, making block patterns. Um, they're good at getting visual illusions. Um, so that's also kind of related to that, what I just talked about. There's another interesting factor. Um, we can do a test of local versus global processing, which is completely related to this. Um, and what you find is that you can make you know, H's out of little S's and S's out of little H's. You know what I mean. I think I got that from stuff. But, um, and you can ask people to detect, um, you know, is there an S in this figure? Or is there an H in this figure? Um, and it turns out that um, kids with autism are faster at answering that question for the little S's. And the little, so they would see the S in that sooner than an H see the H sooner in that rather than an S compared to typically developing kids. And so there's this advantage for processing the details. So that's a good thing, advantages. But there are also problems with this weak central coherence, not problems, but there are disadvantages to having weak central coherence. So for example, you'll find in visual processing tasks that kids um, might have trouble taking visual stimuli like this and putting them into two categories. Because to them, every single one is different. And they're gonna to wanna to make lots of different categories rather than, than being able to see the similarities. 
right? And that also happens with semantic categorization. So if you give people words, um, they'll do the same sort of thing. They'll put them in many, many different categories rather than being able to see the commonalities. Does that, does that seem familiar with any of you that work with people with autism that, that, that would seem like a common characteristic? So it's been tested. Um, my little anecdote here is about my son who, um, when he was in high school, he, he was assigned, they were allowed to write a paper about anything. So, you know, the kids are writing papers about, you know, who knows, you know, the, the World Series or, <laughs> you know, butterflies or something. And so he's writing a paper about Turing machines, which is, um, you know, sort of a theoretical idea in computer science, basically. <laughs> and he's sitting there trying to write this paper, and it's like, I, I can't think of what to put in the paper. So we said, well, why don't you include, you know, a page about Turing's life? Well, no, that has nothing to do with, he couldn't understand how you could include, uh, you know, a section on Turing's life if you were, who's a person and, and talk about Turing machines. So, uh, yeah, so that's the categorization disadvantage. Um, and now it turns out, now to link all of this information together, the, the lateralization stuff and the weak central coherence, it turns out that this local versus global processing is differently lateralized, okay? So if you use these stimuli in, in regular subjects and you present it to the left or right visual fields, it turns out that your left hemisphere is, guess what, better at the details, and your right hemisphere is better at the big picture. Um, so this is all kind of coming together now. Um, so overall, what we have are lateralized difference in processing, differences between the left, visually for local versus global, and then semantically with the metaphors. Okay, so left hemisphere good at, at visual details, left hemisphere good at close semantic relationships, right hemisphere good at um, seeing the forest um, or the, the big picture, and also good at seeing these more distant semantic relationships. So, we can take a look at this and say we've got left hemisphere, close semantic relationships, right hemisphere, broader semantic relationships, and we could say maybe that's kind of related to weak coherence in autism versus strong coherence so these are some of the ideas that I have been trying to investigate. Um, so to pull it all together for you, um, lateralization differences um, or a leftward processing style that you have in autism could perhaps lead to or be a result of weak central coherence. Um, and that could result in tendency to categorize words and meanings very narrowly rather than being able to see the connection um, and thus have trouble with conceptual integration you know getting those overlapping circles to have any meaning um, and also therefore difficulty with understanding metaphors and so it, it relates especially to unfamiliar metaphors and it could also apply to sarcasm, inference, idioms, indirect requests. And then actually we know that the right hemisphere is also important for prosody, so I didn't really bring that into this, this talk, but that's kind of where we're at. Um, so um, I wanted to thank you for listening, and don't bite your tongue.